this time of year always reminds me of trying to get my children ready. Do you ever have those days, trying to get everybody ready and try to get them all going the same direction? And it reminds me of a young man went to the uh, pet store and decided to get a new pet. And he said, I'd, I'd like a new pet. And the person who owned the store said, well, what kind do you like? Well, I'd like something unusual. He said, well, the new unusual pet these days are a centipede. They have like a hundred legs. They're just the thing. You need one of those. And they work fine in, a, in an apartment. So he took it home with him. And he'd had it about a week and it came around to Sunday and he leaned over the matchbox and said, I'm going to church. Would you like to go too? And he, he didn't hear a thing out of the centipede. But he said it again. Well, today is Sunday and I go to church. Would you like to go to church as well? And it was quiet. Finally, he leaned over and real loudly said, I'm going to church. We're going to learn about God. This will be really good. Would you like to go? And he heard a little tiny voice out of the box go, I heard you the first time. I just started putting my shoes on then. <laughs> it is bad. <laughs> but for those of you who have dressed a group of children to go to church... No, my prayers are with you. Well, as we move into this week's text, um, I spoke a little bit last week about how Hebrews is a different book than we're used to. It's a different way of thinking than we typically think. Uh, it, it thinks more in symbols and symbology and uh, particular language from the Old Testament. And so I'm going to preface that the section that I'm reading out of Hebrews this morning, if I picked it up and just started reading, my bet is it would make no sense. And, and I do that off of some research. I asked four people, I read it just and started it, and all four said it didn't make any sense, and two of them were preachers. So I'm going to give you a little, bit of, a little bit of background on what it says before I read it, so you're kind of all on the same page with me. This particular section of Hebrews goes all the way back to Exodus. It goes to the book of Exodus somewhere around the ninth chapter, or Deuteronomy around the 19th chapter, and it speaks about the experience of the Israelites when they leave Egypt and they come to Mount Sinai and God comes down on Mount Sinai and when He does, it's a terribly fearful thing that happens. Do you guys remember this story? At least you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments, right? And so here we have the image. The people have shown up around the mountain. God says, don't come up on the mountain. Don't let any animals on the mountain. If they do stone them, you stay away and, and put a hedge up. I find it interesting that he had to tell them to stay away because they all seemed so scared. I don't think anybody was going up there anyway. Uh, there was probably a few teenage boys that thought it would be fun, but right? Because they'll scale a water tower. Lord knows why. So, so God says, don't come around here. Now, from there, it's juxtaposed. It's put right against this other image of God is moving this group of people to this next set of movement, that is, where are we today? What is the kingdom of God, and how are we being moved into the kingdom of God, and how does that look as opposed to the other story? And then it lands on, remember your God is a consuming fire. That is, same God, different story of where we are. So that's our Hebrews text this morning. The, the book of Luke is much more simple. Jesus goes to the temple. There is a woman there who is infirm for 18 years, uh, apparently with a demon who has kept her in bondage. Jesus sets her free. Uh, believe this or not, the religious leaders are not altogether thrilled, and, and Jesus puts them in their place. So it, it's an incredibly pretty straightforward story. Well, let's pick up in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the 18th verse. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, to gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast, or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches that mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to a mountain, Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, 
whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men who were perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who has warned us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heavens. The words once more indicating the removal of what could not be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken then remains. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And in the book of Luke, the 13th chapter, the 10th verse, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and let it out and give him water? Then should this not be with this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years long, be set free on the Sabbath day from what has bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The text from Hebrews for the first century people would have immediately rung in their ears, the text from Exodus. I mean, it would have been so glaringly apparent where that came from. That would have been the thing they heard. They would have seen that whole image. But I have to bring up the book of Exodus for this reason. It has a great name, Exodus, where we get the word to exit, right? There, there's an exit right there. We have exit, exit. We get the word exit from Exodus. Now, why do we get the word exit from Exodus? Because the people were leaving right? The people were going somewhere. Now, do you remember where they were leaving from? Egypt. And what were they doing in Egypt? They were slaves. Hey, how about that? They were on their way to freedom. Uh, one of the things that's really fascinating uh, that I love about God is that God is a God of liberation. God is setting people free. He is breaking bonds. He is moving us into freedom. Yet, a lot of times people don't understand that that's one of the major movements within Scripture and within the world. There is a movement from darkness to light, from chaos to order. Thanks be to God for those who are starting school, right? All the moms. Yeah, moving from chaos to order. Teachers, don't you love that? A little order in the world would be good. And then we move also from bondage to freedom. Uh, when I was teaching some men in Kingwood, I told them, I said, do you realize that Scripture is your guide to freedom? And one of the men said, I've never viewed the Bible as a way to freedom. I see the Bible as a way to, I have to do things. And I go, well, you got it all wrong. You see, Scripture and God is in the freedom business. He's in moving us to freedom. And so here we have in Exodus a group of people who are being moved to freedom. And I really love this passage where they land in Exodus. Because if you remember what they get when they get to the desert, they go to the mountain. And what do they get when they get to the mountain? And God says, don't come up here, but Moses does. What does Moses bring down from the top of the mountain? 
The Ten Commandments, you guys know this story. You guys went to Sunday school, right? You at least saw Charlton Heston, right? He was standing there with the... Things go badly when they show up with the calf, doesn't it? Yeah, don't make golden calves. Bad thing. So Charlton Heston shows up with the Ten Commandments. And and so I've got to ask this question about the Ten Commandments. The first three are about God, right? Worship God alone, right? Don't take, uh, don't make any graven images. Don't worship imagery, whether below the sea or above the earth. Or there's a whole list. You got to love it. God gets real specific, because if not, right, we have to find a way to do it. And then the third one is, don't take my name in vain, right? And then we get to the fourth one, and the fourth one, fourth. Do you get to an age and your fingers don't bend right anymore? It's just me? Yeah, right. (laughs) The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Have you ever thought about why that's the fourth commandment? Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, don't run around, right? Don't covet, honor your mother and father. Those are all behind this one. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. There's got to be a reason why this is number four. It's got to be number four for a good reason, and it's way up the list. I don't know if you've thought about that. And then I'm going to get to think of it this way. If you're trying to move a group of people who have been slaves for hundreds of years and move them to freedom, you don't just have to move them. You don't have to just change their zip code, right? You've got to change more than their zip code. Uh, as one person used to teach in sales, he goes, you know what changes when you move from one location to another? Just your zip. You've got to change what's in their minds. You've got to change what's in their hearts. They have the slavery built in. They don't have the right mindset. And so they have to be recreated. They have to be made ready for freedom. So God says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, I'm going to remind you of what was life probably like in Egypt. Does anybody want to recall what you would probably be doing seven days a week? What did they do? They made bricks, didn't they? Uh, They had quotas for bricks. So on Monday, they made bricks. On Tuesday, they made bricks. On Wednesday, guess what they made? Bricks. Guess what happened on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Bricks. Bricks, 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 bricks. Do you think that you would begin to tie your value to what you did? You started to become... Your value was what you did. They had become human doings instead of human beings. Can anybody relate to that one? You ever feel like a human doing as opposed to a human being? And so God says, stop every seven days. Come to worship. Take some time off. Meditate on Scripture. Pray. Spend time with me. Take a break. You see, I, I think I need to make this connection, and this is what the whole sermon is about. And once you get this, you go, that's, that, that's the whole idea of this whole sermon. The road to freedom, the road to breaking bondage, is always through worship. The road to freedom, the road to breaking bonds, the roads to breaking chains, is getting the right God, worshiping the right God, and doing it consistently, and it will break chains in your life, and it will set you free. And God thinks it's so important, it becomes the fourth commandment. And so we have to remember to take a day off once a week. Does this sound pretty good? You didn't think you were going to get to come to church and hear this idea. You need to take a day off a week. You need to remember the God. You need to spend time alone with God. How many of you have such a busy life that you don't think you could stick another thing in it? Anybody ever there? Is that the way life is? Yeah. College students, God bless y'all's heart. And you're here on Sunday. And Wednesday, that's right. But you, you know what happens is, is you continue to do and do and do and do, and you can't ever remember what is important. You can't remember what life's about. Can you imagine spending every day always doing, always doing, and always doing, and never get what we preachers call balcony time? Time to look from God's perspective. Time to see what it's all about. 
You, you guys know that I spent a lot of my life in suburbia being a banker. And you know what? Large corporate America expects that you work a lot every day. Can, can you imagine this? Uh, I, I said, they, you know how they made money? Uh, they bought low and they sold high. Uh, they bought my time cheap and they sold it for more. And they tried to sell as much of it as they could. Can you picture this? And, and you know what they did was... And I don't think this was intentional. I don't think anybody went about it. But in, in a thought process is they hung the good life out there in front of you and said, here, chase after the good life. And the good life is when you finally have enough, you can be enough, but you've got to have enough to be enough. And then the only way you know that you have enough is you look around the people around you and see how much they have. And then when I have more than they have, then I finally have arrived. Uh, did anybody else sign up for this program? You know, and, and then one day, you know, you come out of college, you get in line behind the people in front of you, you take the job, you put your head down, you plow forward day after day after day, and then one day you're mowing the lawn or you're looking at, you're going to work every day and you go, well, what, what's it all about? Why am I in bondage to this? God says, take a day every week. And set it aside. You know, I think we've, we've made a mistake as Protestants, as, as Christians, as those who follow Jesus, or at least I did. I read the Scripture, and I saw how Jesus was always giving the Sabbath a hard time. Did, did you all see that in Scripture? Jesus is always getting in trouble for breaking the Sabbath, right? Well, then I began to look at it, and I go, well, what did he really get in trouble for doing on the Sabbath? I mean, consistently, what was the problem? Uh, he healed people, right? And he ate. Uh, one day he was gleaning some crops. He was going along picking some, some wild rice, and he, not rice, excuse me, wheat, and just ate it. And he got into trouble. Uh, Jesus was getting in trouble from the religious leaders. And when I read this scripture today, what did Jesus get into trouble for? He was healing somebody on the Sabbath. But, but I want to make this connection with you about worship. He was in worship, and he was setting somebody's bondage free. You know, that's what worship's supposed to do. That's what worship's supposed to be. When you go to worship and you worship the right God and, you, and you're really engaged, it breaks chains and it sets people free. That's what Sunday's supposed to be about. And so Jesus is there at the synagogue and there is a woman in bondage and Jesus sets her free. And the religious teacher is indignant. I, I would hope that if Jesus walked in here and set somebody free, I wouldn't be upset about it. But I'm not going to bet any money on it. Uh, because pride goes before all of us. So what does the religious do? He's, he's had his thunder stolen. And so he goes, Jesus, Jesus, look, there are six days a week for you to be stealing the show. Why don't you use one of those days, right? I mean, that's his argument, right? You, you're going to do your doctor thing. There are six other days to be doing this business. Uh, and, I, and I do have to give the religious teachers some credit for this. They understood the Sabbath was important. But they made it all about the Sabbath, not about being with God. You can get the focus all wrong. And then we know that what Jesus did was right, not only because it was Jesus, but because the religious teacher was what? He was humiliated. Look, you're usually not humiliated if you're right, are you? When do you get humiliated? When you're wrong. That's right. He was wrong. You, you see, Jesus said, look, you've got it all wrong about the Sabbath. What the Sabbath is supposed to be is it's made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. You see, this is supposed to be good. This is supposed to be right. It's supposed to be setting people free. It's supposed to be moving us from the land of Egypt to the promised land. It's supposed to be lifting us up from bondage to the kingdom of God. So we need this time away from bricks, 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 bricks. Anybody been there? And we lose what's important. We forget what we should be about. You know, I'm, I meet people all the time, and, and they're not exactly happy with their life. Uh, I like to suggest that's how they end up in my office. Uh, they come in and they're not real excited about how everything is going. Uh, they're not happy about things. Yet they don't want to make changes 
to get to the freedom. I've got to say this about the Israelites. They complained till there was no end, did they? God picks them up. He moves them out in the desert. And what do they say? We don't like the desert. What would you do? You brought us out here to die? We don't like the food. We don't like the water. I'm not too thrilled with my neighbor. Right? I don't think we really want to do the hard work of moving into freedom. We'd rather stay in the bondage that we're comfortable in. This is where it gets personal, so you can pull your toes back now. Uh, you know, I don't think we really, all the time I meet people and they go, you know, I want a different life, but I don't want to do what it takes to get to that. And I go, you know, a lot of times it takes understanding where you are and how you got there. And it takes a God that's powerful enough to move to change you and your circumstances. You see, I think that's one of the things that's very right about the imagery of God in the desert is this is a powerful, awestruck God that deserves fear. Do you, do you see that picture in God there? It's a God that overthrew the most powerful nation at the time, Egypt. Egypt was not to be trifled with. What kind of God pulls people out of it? A powerful God. And you know what? The people got it. And they go, you know what we want? We don't want to draw near to that. Well, let me tell you, that's the problem in worship is you are invited to be near to a God that can change your life. But that's not always pleasant, is it? You see, that's the image that we have today with Jesus, is we have the image of Jesus, whom is a God that draws near to us, and we can be right there in the loving presence of God. But we shouldn't forget, this is a God who is a consuming fire. So I've had men in, in my office in suburbia, they go, I want my life different. I want to change things. I want to be in a different place. And I said, you know, there's a way to that. But you're going to have to engage in that personal relationship with God. You're going to have to move clear and close enough for Jesus to speak truth into your life. And that's what happens in worship, in true worship. When you're finally there right before God, God can speak to you truth in your life. And you know what? It's not going to be always pleasant words. It's not going to be sweet nothings. But that is a God who changes things. And breaks chains and moves us to freedom. I want to give you the courage to step into that. You know, I, many of y'all know that I do prison ministry and I've done that for quite a while and I work with men that have all sorts of issues in their life. You think you have issues? Go meet men in maximum security prisons. Right, John? Yeah, you got men with real issues. Uh, drugs, alcohol, broken families, uh, you name it, the whole nine yards. There is all sorts of bondage and it is not only bondage of their body but bondage of their mind and they need to be set free. Well, at Kairos, we go and we spend three days. We teach them a short course on Christianity. We put them in small groups so they can work through their problems. But i got to tell you this. One of the books we give them, we give them a book called A Freedom Guide. A Freedom Guide. And, and I saw this on, on my desk the other day preparing the sermon. I thought, what a God moment. Thank you, God. I need that book. A Freedom Guide. And, and i got to ask you, it's 28 pages, and they're little pages. What would you write if you wanted to help somebody move to freedom, to move away from addictions and pains and brokenness, what advice would you give them in 28 pages? And I, and I looked through this book, and you know what this book has in it? It's filled with meditations, prayer, and worship. Meditations, prayer, and worship. It knows that in 28 pages it can't do it, but what it can do is it, it can take you to the God who can change everything. Do you have fear in your life? Do you have places and things that need changing? Do you have addictions, brokenness? Do you have hurts in your life that you need to be healed from? There's a God who wants to set you free. But it's a scary place. So let's pray together this morning. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we approach Your throne, Your throne of grace, and You told us to approach 
without fear and trembling, yet we are afraid. And we come and we kneel before you and we ask that you be tender with each of us. But do as you will. Take us where you will. Do with what you will with each of us. And bring us into through Jesus Christ so that we may serve with joyful obedience each day from now through eternity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.